Broadcom is widely considered one of the best dividend growth stocks you can buy. Over the past decade, Broadcom stock has generated an annualized total return of 37.64%. So every $1,000 invested in the company would now be worth over $24,000. That's insane. So what's the secret behind Broadcom's massive growth? Is Broadcom stock still a good investment moving into the future? In today's video, I will share the full story of Broadcom and explain whether it deserves a place in your investment portfolio. This includes a deep dive into the company's history, business model, financials, acquisitions, risks, and current valuation. Let's roll the intro. My name is Zach, this is Dividend Data, and you should leave a like and subscribe if you enjoy the video. As the great Warren Buffett says, quote, never invest in a business you cannot understand. So today, I'm going to do a full stock review of Broadcom. Throughout, I will be using my own research software available at DividendData.com. This tool provides fundamentals on over 8,000 US stocks. I designed it so you can easily understand a stock's financials through both visualizations and data tables. Become a member of DividendData.com to support the channel and research stocks just like me. With that said, let's look at the history of Broadcom. In 2020, in 2022, the global technology company is a major player in semiconductors across multiple categories while also expanding into infrastructure software. This past year, Broadcom generated over $33 billion of revenue and $16 billion in free cash flow. That makes it one of the largest semiconductor companies in the world, despite many being unfamiliar with the brand. The company is a corporate giant that has radically evolved over the decades through countless mergers and acquisitions. Broadcom has a long, complex history. It's honestly a complete mess to try and understand. The core of the business was founded in 1961 as the semiconductor division of Hewlett Packard, better known as HP. In 1999, this semiconductor division was spun off, becoming Agilent Technologies Semiconductor Products Group. In 2005, private equity firms KKR and Silver Lake Partners acquired Agilent Semiconductor Group for $2.66 billion to form Avago Technologies. Technologies. At the time, this made Avago Technologies the world's largest privately held semiconductor company. Hock Tan was shortly then hired as its CEO, a position he still holds today. In my opinion, this private equity origin is vital to understand about the company. In many ways, its core mission is profit and growth. It's all about the money. Money wins. On August 6, 2009, Avago Technologies went public on NASDAQ with the ticker symbol AVGO. Over the following decade, Avago would make countless acquisitions, both big and small. The strategy was to use excess cash flows to acquire new businesses, increasing exposure to the growing semiconductor industry. These businesses are often high free cash flow, growing, and complementary to their existing portfolio. I'm going to share the most notable acquisitions. In 2014, Avago Technology Technologies acquired LSI Corporation for $6.6 billion. LSI had origins all the way back to the 1960s with AT&T's Bell Labs. The acquisition helped move Avago Technologies away from specialized products towards a more mainstream industry, which included chips, especially storage for data centers. In 2016, Avago Technologies bought Broadcom Corporation for $37 billion. This was $17 billion in cash and $20 billion in shares. The combined company would take the name Broadcom but retain the Vago leadership and Hock Tan would remain CEO. At the time, the combined company had annual revenue of $15 billion and became the global diversified leader in wired and wireless communication semiconductors. Broadcom strengthened Avago Technologies' patent position significantly in sectors such as mobile, the data center, and Internet of Things. In case you can't tell, Hock Tan and the Broadcom Avago management are dealmaker machines. In 2017, Broadcom acquired Brocade Communication Systems for $5.9 billion. This was a shift in strategy as this acquisition allowed them to start offering software solutions to their existing semiconductor customers. That side of the business would be a key part of their 
their future growth strategy. But they were not done with semiconductors. That same year, Broadcom proposed to acquire Qualcomm for over $130 billion in cash and stock. This merger would give Broadcom dominance in mobile semiconductors. However, this deal faced significant pressure from US regulators. There were possible antitrust concerns and what was called foreign security concerns from the Trump administration. Hock Tan and Broadcom management pulled out all the stops to try and get the deal done. They moved the company headquarters and incorporation from Singapore to the United States. Tan met with Trump multiple times and gave favorable press conferences. Ultimately, the deal was blocked by US regulators over national security concerns. For Broadcom, this was disappointing. It started to raise some investor concern about if the company was becoming too large for their iconic merger and acquisition strategy that has created so much shareholder value. Well, they got right back to it, but on the new infrastructure software side of the business. In 2018, Broadcom acquired CA Technologies for $18.9 billion in cash. This is one of the world's leading providers of IT management software and solutions. The acquisition was a huge signal of Broadcom's interest in software and building recurring revenue. Some analysts did not like the decision, but time has seemed to prove them wrong so far. In 2019, Broadcom acquired Symantec Enterprise Security Business for $10.7 billion in cash. It expands Broadcom's infrastructure software footprint with a top suite of integrated enterprise security solutions. In 2021, these software businesses were rebranded as Broadcom Software. Broadcom has now broadened its vision to, quote, build one of the world's leading infrastructure technology companies. This is across... This is across both semiconductors and software. In 2022, Broadcom announced the intent to acquire VMware for approximately $61 billion. This would be in both cash and stock. If the deal goes through, Broadcom's shareholder base will be approximately 88% Broadcom shareholders and 12% VMware shareholders. This deal is not yet complete and is still pending regulatory approval. In the 2023 Q1 earnings call, CEO Hock Tan stated they still expect the deal to close in their fiscal year 2023. I'll talk more about this VMware acquisition later in the video. With that complex history, what does Broadcom's business actually look like today? Broadcom has 22 category-leading semiconductor and infrastructure software divisions. They have one of the industry's broadest IP portfolios with over 17,000 patents. Their largest business segment at roughly 80% of current revenue is semiconductor solutions, with the rest being from infrastructure software. However, However, if the VMware acquisition goes through, that pie will grow significantly. Semiconductor Solutions is broken up into networking, broadband, server storage, wireless, and industrial. Broadcom's motto is, quote, connecting everything. According to them, 99.9% .9 of all internet traffic crosses at least one Broadcom chip. This is because of their diversified business across the entire ecosystem. This is from access points like mobile handsets, Wi-Fi, broadband, cable, etc., carrier networks and internet service providers, data centers both on-premises and in the cloud. Broadcom's networking division involves switching, routing, physical layers, optical interconnections, etc. This is for enterprises, internet service providers, and hyperscale data centers. Examples of hyperscale data centers include AWS, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, etc. The server-slash-storage division sells to the enterprise and hyperscale data centers. This includes fiber channel HBAs and SAN fabric, RAID adapters, SSD and HDD controllers and preamps, Ethernet NIC, etc. The broadband division provides end-to-end -end semiconductor solutions from the connected devices to customers on premises and the internet service providers. This includes things like your Wi-Fi router, cable modem, etc. The wireless division is across all mobile devices like smartphones, smartwatches, laptops, tablets, and Internet of Things devices. Example chips made by Broadcom include RF front end, Wi-Fi Bluetooth, Bluetooth combo, GNSS receivers, touch controllers, inductive charging, optical sensing, etc. The industrial division has solutions for multiple end markets like factory automation, renewable energy, and automotive electronics. Increasingly, these are becoming more high-tech, requiring more semiconductor solutions. Broadcom's semiconductor solutions segment is diversified across these markets with teams focused on the continued research, design, and sale of these chips. However, Broadcom in 
importantly, does not manufacture semiconductors. Instead, they follow the fabulous model, getting Broadcom design chips manufactured by Taiwan Semiconductor, Global Foundries, Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corporation, etc. This outsourcing dramatically reduces capital investment needed, which we will soon discuss. Broadcom's infrastructure software segment focuses on enterprise solutions for mainframe, distributed computing, cybersecurity, identity management, and payment security. The goal is to focus on large enterprise customers with expanding IT budgets. They are looking for complex IT infrastructure across a hybrid and multi-cloud approach. The goal is to help solve these complex problems, locking in customer relationships, and offering more software solutions over time. Land and expand. This is what they do with their security software, for example. The acquisition of VMware is an attempt to turbocharge this strategy as it is a much larger company with deep customer relationships. So by now, you should have a good understanding of Broadcom's current business. With its private equity origin, it becomes clear that the company operates with a major focus on financials and shareholder returns. The management has gained a reputation for cost cutting and maximizing free cash flow from its acquisitions. This reputation is looked at negatively by some, but has led to absolutely stellar financial results. Now I'm going to analyze the stock of Broadcom from the perspective of a long-term investor. To do so, I will be using the stock research tool I developed, which is available at DividendData.com. Become a member so you can follow along and look at Broadcom's financials with me. Broadcom, ticker symbol AVGO, is priced at $619.23 per share, with 416.92 million shares outstanding, giving it a current market cap of $250. $58 billion. Gap EPS over the trailing 12 months is $29.69. At the current price, this gives it a P ratio of 20.86. The forward-looking annual dividend is $18.40, giving it a 2.97% dividend yield. As you can see, Broadcom's stock price has grown significantly over the past decade. This is backed up by a rapid growth of their non-GAAP earnings per share. Notably, Broadcom's earnings have continued growing at a time when many of their semiconductor peers are struggling. If we look at some of their key per share financials, it's very impressive. Revenue per share has grown at a 23.74% 10-year compound annual growth rate. This slowed down to a 13.27% five-year CAGR. However, in the past year, they saw 21.25% growth in annual revenue per share. Free cash flow is even more impressive. Broadcom is a free cash flow machine. Over the past 10 years, the compound annual growth rate of free cash flow per share is 35.98%. This has slowed but remained very strong. The three-year CAGR is 19.66%. In fiscal 2022, free cash flow per share grew at 22 2.75%. This is massive growth. It can't be understated how impressive this is, especially in 2022 when the economy slowed massively, specifically in tech. The ability to grow in this environment shows the robustness, discipline, and diversification of Broadcom's business. In 2022, Broadcom generated $39.88 in annual free cash flow per share. This is the core metric through which you should value Broadcom stock. At current prices, the company is only 15 0.6 times free cash flow per share. This is an attractive valuation given their high growth rates. More on that later. At October 30th, 2022, the price to free cash flow ratio was 11.79 with a free cash flow yield of 8.48%. In retrospect, this seemed like a great buying opportunity for the company. Broadcom's margin growth in recent years is very impressive. Since 2020, gross margins, operating margins, and net margins have climbed steadily. The fact that margins can continued to grow in 2022 and 2023 Q1 is impressive. This quarter, Broadcom posted 67% gross margins and 42% net margins. This is a product of financial discipline, supply chain management, and strong demand. There are many semiconductor companies like Intel who completely mismanage supply during this time. For example, Intel now has a chip glut, forcing them to cut prices to get rid of excess inventory. After listening to Broadcom's latest earnings call, CEO CEO Hawk Tan mentioned that they kept inventories tight throughout the chip shortage so that they would not be caught with an oversupply if demand dropped. 
Instead, Broadcom raised prices, kept prices high, and has retained a strong supply and demand relationship. Broadcom's diversified and growing markets have allowed them to skirt through better than most companies I've analyzed. The massive growth in Broadcom's free cash flow has allowed them to reward shareholders. They pay a fast-growing dividend. Since their dividend program started in 2010, the company has reliably grown it at least every year. Over the past 10 years, the compound annual growth rate of the dividend is 39%. Now, of course, this has slowed down, but they are still growing at a high rate. The five-year CAGR sits at around 20%. The latest dividend increase was 12.2%. Prior to that, it was 13.89%. I'd expect 10 to 15% dividend growth for the foreseeable future. Given the free cash flow growth, Broadcom's dividend is safe. In fiscal 2022, the payout ratio based on net income is 61%. However, based on free cash flow, it's more like 46%. Despite payout ratio often being calculated with net income, it's important to remember that the capacity to pay dividends truly comes from free cash flow. Let's dive deeper into that by looking at Broadcom's cash flow statement. Here you can see that their free cash flow has grown from $1.7 billion in 2015 to $16.31 billion in 2022. In that same time, the annual dividends paid have grown from $408 million to $7 billion. Notice that every year, the dividend is well below free cash flow. This gives them plenty of capital to pay off debt, buy back shares, and make acquisitions. I want to emphasize how capital capital efficient Broadcom is as a business. In recent years, capital expenditures have hovered around $400 million a year. Broadcom is a fabulous company that does not have to invest in manufacturing. This is vital to understand. They don't have to get into the spending wars of tens of billions of dollars building out new chip fabrication plants. Instead, Broadcom can benefit from all of this at no cost to them. They can take virtually all their profits and invest in growing their own business or rewarding shareholders. Think about the compounding nature of this year after year. That's so much cash being used to grow shareholder value rather than being put into the dirt. If you don't think this is a big deal, all you have to do is look at Intel. In 2022, Intel generated $15.4 billion in operating cash flow while spending over $25 billion dollars in capital expenditures. That put free cash flow at negative $9.6 billion. Although Intel may improve earnings in the coming years, they will still have to keep investment high just in order to compete with other manufacturers like TSMC. That's just the cost of doing business. Fabulous companies like Broadcom can take advantage of all of this investment while retaining their own profits. This is so significant. Despite all of Broadcom's massive acquisitions, they still have a very very strong balance sheet. They have $12.4 billion in cash on hand and $27 billion in net debt. That is under two times annual free cash flow. The company has shown the discipline to deleverage after every acquisition made. So even with the pending VMware acquisition, history has shown that Broadcom will juice free cash flow and pay off debt. Speaking of VMware, this acquisition will be a significant addition to Broadcom's portfolio of businesses. Based on 2021's financials, it's estimated that the acquisition would make the infrastructure software side of Broadcom roughly 49% of revenue. That's a huge change just over the past five years. VMware is the industry leader in private cloud infrastructure, growing into multi-cloud, application development, and adjacent software. They fit well into Broadcom's existing software strategy. It's a category leader with a large enterprise customer base. It will help deepen their customer relationship with sticky, complex software solutions. If we look at VMware's stock in DividendData.com, it's no slouch itself. They have a growing base of recurring revenue. They've been generating around $4 billion in annual free cash flow in recent years. Strong balance sheet, no financial red flags. According to Broadcom, they think they can grow VMware's profitability significantly. They are projecting an increase from $4.7 billion in EBITDA to $8.5 billion. This would be through continued revenue growth and eliminating duplicative costs. Plus, they would have a greater focus on growing existing customers, including the existing Broadcom software suite. It will certainly be interesting to see if Broadcom gets this acquisition approved. In the past few weeks, it was announced that the companies would extend the merger close deadline by three months. CEO Hak Tan said on the Q1 earnings call that he expects the deal to close in fiscal 2023. If the VMware deal goes through, it would dramatically improve the software side of the business. Also, an indirect effect may be that the diversification could allow Broadcom to be more aggressive with future semiconductor
Semiconductor Acquisitions and Mergers, Qualcomm Round 2, question mark? If VMware is blocked, Broadcom will likely go for smaller targets. In the meantime, they can pay off debt, buy back shares, and grow the dividend payment. Throughout this stock review video, I've been mostly positive in my analysis of the company. However, that does not mean that there are no risks. In fact, there are quite a few. First, their CEO Hak Tan is 70 years old and may retire soon. His management has been the main constant through Broadcom's rise, putting together a stellar merger and acquisition track record. Also, it's obvious Tan has a major focus on financials and generating shareholder returns. It's unknown whether the deal-making style and financial focus will continue after his tenure. Other risks include regulatory groups blocking future acquisitions. This was emphasized during the Qualcomm deal. That could start to cap some of Broadcom's growth opportunities. Other risks are the commoditization of some of their chips. This is happening most notably in smartphones. Companies like Apple are opting to design more and more of their chips and outsourcing just the manufacturing. This is an example of them cutting out the middleman, in this case, Broadcom. Apple has announced they will start phasing out Broadcom's Wi-Fi slash Bluetooth chip for their own design chips in iPhones by 2025. This is significant. Apple is one of Broadcom's largest customers. Apple's decision is likely to hit Broadcom revenue by about $1 billion to $1.5 billion, said Stacey Razgan, an analyst with financial services firm A.B. Bernstein. That said, Broadcom still supplies other chips in the iPhone and related Apple devices. However, this trend of Apple designing its own chip will likely continue into the future. It has already been seen with them moving away from Intel for Macs and soon moving away from Qualcomm for select iPhone chips. However, this is just one market and is only a concern among premier customers like Apple. It is unlikely smaller companies in smartphones or other categories would invest in the capability to design chips themselves. It's just not feasible for the vast majority of companies. Luckily, Broadcom's semiconductor business is diversified across many end markets. However, this is still a real concern and could even spread into other high-end markets. Perhaps hyperscale data centers like AWS and Azure want to design their own chips for specific use cases. It's possible. Heck, Tesla even designs its own GPUs for training AI models. This reality, along with the blocked Qualcomm acquisition, are likely factors influencing why Broadcom has been aggressively moving into software. That said, this is by no means a lethal risk to Broadcom. Their semiconductor business will likely continue growing massively into the future. Other risks are the lack of corporate identity and culture. In many ways, Broadcom is a tech Frankenstein monster that has been stacked together through countless acquisitions and mergers. It does make me wonder how fragile this model is. Could a few bad deals make it fall down? It remains to be seen. One thing is for sure, the money doesn't lie. Broadcom is a financial beast, but is the stock attractive at current prices. But is the stock attractive at current prices? Well, it is trading at under 16 times 2022's annual free cash flow. That is not a high multiple at all, especially given their high growth rates. I would actually challenge you to find a stock that is trading at this multiple with the same track record of reliable growth. As a long-term investment, Broadcom will likely generate solid returns at the current price. Of course, that is depending on the future growth remaining reasonably high. Even even with a regression to 10% dividend and free cash flow growth, I'd still expect strong total returns. That said, Broadcom stock was trading much cheaper in the fall of 2022. In fact, it was nearly 30% cheaper than current prices. Obviously, the stock is a better value at those prices. You would have a much greater margin of safety. However, it remains to be seen whether it can return to those levels. The company had a strong Q1 and there is now greater visibility into their financials. Growth may slow, but Broadcom is unlikely to hit an earnings earnings recession like some of its peers. So what's my strategy with Broadcom stock? I recently purchased 11 shares at an average cost per share of $577.44. I'm up over 6% on my investment so far. This decision was made as I sold my Intel stock and wanted to build a starting position in the company. Over the near term, my plan is to continue adding shares if the stock starts dipping closer to those October 2022 lows. At that point, I'd likely start buying more aggressively into 
into the stock. In the meantime, I will continue reinvesting my dividends to acquire more shares. I already have over $50 in Broadcom dividends coming later this month. Over the long term, I'm planning to make Broadcom a core position. I will dollar cost average and buy on dips in price. However, if the company sees a significant change in strategy or decline in financials, then I will reevaluate my investment thesis. Given my dividend growth investing strategy, many in my community have been suggesting Broadcom stock. For years now, I didn't buy the stock because of how confusing I found their business. However, after learning more about the company and the broader semiconductor industry this past year, I now feel comfortable adding it to my portfolio. I understand their business and realize this fits perfectly into my dividend growth strategy. To a certain extent, the money doesn't lie. So that's my plan for buying Broadcom stock, but don't take my opinion blindly. Be sure to do your own research before making any investment decisions. Future performance is unpredictable and could change from any number of conditions. Thank you for watching Dividend Data. You can sign up for DividendData.com to use my stock research tool and track your portfolio just like me. Additionally, you can gain access to an exclusive Discord community of like-minded investors. Follow me on Twitter for breaking dividend news and thank you for watching.